the state of Vargas. Here on the north coast of Venezuela, the only building locations are gravel banks located at the base of steep mountain sides of the 2,000 meter high Sierra. In December 1999, in just three days, it rained almost twice as much as it normally rains in one year. On the 15th of December, the people heard a rumbling, unlike any other sound, coming from the valleys of the Sierra. Debris flows gush like water, although they consist of up to 80% earth and rock. One of the biggest debris avalanches tore through the settlement of Los Corrales at a speed of 50 kilometers an hour. Built on the gravel banks of former flows, only a few of the many houses held up against the violent force of the raging monster. The masses of mud and rocks even reached the second floor of this building. Octavio Herrera did not realize the acute danger he and his family lived in. It invaded the flat. The wall was broken and a huge tree came in as well. It was two meters high. The tide took everything with it. It dragged my mother-in-law, who was holding Valentina, and my wife, who was around here. In this area, which is not here anymore, the bedroom used to be here. She was holding our girl. The last thing I heard her say was, it's dragging me, it's dragging me, and it did. I held myself, I grabbed this metal rod here, and I held on to it until 9 o'clock the next day. Gloria, Octavio Herrera's wife, and their little daughters, Gabriela and Valentina, had disappeared without a trace. At 10 o'clock, you're playing with your daughter, and all of a sudden, an hour and a half later, you've got nothing. You've got no family. Everything you had done in your life was gone in less than five minutes. It faded away. It's really hard. Debris flows and landslides devastated the coast for more than 50 kilometers. Octavio Herrera had little hope of finding his loved ones. Well, no. It was when I think I was always conscious of it. I was always aware that they had died. There was a huge sea of mud. You could see the cars sinking and all the houses too. People were dragged along on the trees. People that were armless, with no legs. For two days, rescue teams recovered the bodies of thousands of victims. Because his loved ones were not among the dead, Octavio Herrera began to hope that perhaps one of them, no matter which one, might have survived. He ran like a madman through the town, and when he reached the coast, he heard about the miraculous rescue of his daughter, Valentina. Gloria al bravo pueblo que yo hubo lanzó la ley. Valentina's mother had taught her to sing when she was afraid. Valentina lay badly injured under the rubble. Rescuers heard her singing and found her. She lives today with grandmother Melagros Cabrujas. Valentina está viva. Valentina is alive. Well, we were hoping that we might find Gloria, but that didn't happen. Gabriela didn't show up either. However, we're still hopeful that she's alive somewhere. The mud was as thick as liquid cement, and once it caught hold of something, it didn't easily let go. While searching for his family, Octavio Herrera saw a woman stuck up to her chest in the thick mud. I saw this woman buried up to here, and she was yelling, shoot me, shoot me. When we took her out, we found out that she'd been holding her two children's hands, and they were dead. So, I mean, I consider myself a lucky man, because God gave me my daughter back, and my daughter is the reason why I exist. Valentina was badly injured, but she was alive. However, death had claimed its victims from many other families. Officials estimate that as many as 30,000 people may have lost their lives under debris or were swept out to sea. Many of them were never found. There were lots of dead people. I think there were more than 150,000 people, even 200,000 people, no matter what they say. 
Weathering processes fracture the rock and loosen the earth in the extremely steep Sierra. Heavy rainfall penetrates the soil and rock and debris flows rush down the canyons, destroying everything on their way to the alluvial fans at the coast. Geologist José Luis López calculates the amount of water needed to soften the soil to a dangerous level. Over the past few decades, the amount of rainfall here has increased continually. Landslides are mainly caused by water penetrating the earth. As long as the ground is just moist, the surface tension of a thin film of water holds the particles together and secures the subsoil. When water seeps into the earth until it reaches an impenetrable layer, it accumulates and forces the grains of soil to separate. It functions as a type of lubricant, making the ground unstable, perfect conditions for a landslide. The Sierra's layer of earth is very thin. As soon as the ground is saturated, it can become unstable and loses its equilibrium. A landslide breaks loose. When thousands of people live at the foot of such dangerous mountains, disaster is often merely a matter of time. Looking for something to blame for their misery, people often blame nature. I don't like to use the term natural disaster. Uh, the, the disaster is not natural, you know, the rainfall, the debris flow, the flood, they are natural, but the disaster is not natural. The disaster is due to human development in the alluvial fans, to occupations in the canyon of the river. So this is not a natural disaster, it's what we call an unnatural disaster. The people who moved to the steep Sierra were in danger, just like people on the flat alluvial fans. Flat land suitable for building is hard to find in Vargas. When on December 16th in Vargas, the whole Sierra began to move, a debris flow was heading for the town of Makuto. Ana Angulo remembers the devastating debris flow. It was like boo. I've never seen such a thing during the whole 53 years I've been living here. The mud masses reached the main street. People fled to the upper floors of buildings and became trapped. While the debris flow raged through the street, mudslides began to break loose from the mountainsides. Several buildings were hit, even the home of Miriam Guevara. A huge stone came down from the mountain and hit my house. I took the children out of the bedroom. Then my brother-in-law came to take us out of the house because everybody had started to flee. People panicked and tried to flee to the mountains, but landslides were breaking loose everywhere. All I could see was the avalanche coming and uprooting all of the posts. Everyone was screaming. 49 residents of that part of Makuto died. The people who made it to the mountains only managed to salvage the clothes they were wearing. There was no time to take food with them. Wow, at the mountain it was horrible. We almost starved to death. After the rain subsided, the people returned to the valley, and the worst fears were exceeded by the harsh reality. From the flat alluvial plains at the coast, rescue teams slowly made their way to the narrow valleys. Countless bodies were recovered. Many others were never found. Desperation and chaos led to anarchy. Messages written on the walls of the ruins, letting relatives know who survived and where they found shelter. But many
many remained missing, including children. The fate of the missing children never left the minds of the people. Sometimes they even believed the little ones had returned. We could hear noises, children weeping. Somebody was knocking at my door. I felt wires falling on my back or some invisible cloth rubbing against my body. The neighbors kept saying that they could hear children weeping, so we decided to collect some money to build that little chapel. Since then we haven't heard anything else. It seems that the dead are quiet now. The Vargas disaster is said to be the worst to have occurred in Latin America in the 20th century. In Vargas, it was heavy rainfall which caused the debris flows. The landslides themselves were superficial, and the scale of the disaster was caused by the fact that 600 square kilometers were affected by several thousand landslides. Sometimes, surface landslides are just a sign of what is going on inside the mountain. Deep-seated landslides usually move in pulses. They seem to sleep, but heavy rains can wake them up again. Sibratsfell in the west of Austria. Residents had noticed some movement under their feet for quite a while, but then suddenly the whole mountain simply crumbled. Robert Super, geophysicist from Vienna, who'd been watching the sleeping landslide for a while, was called urgently. The first impression was pure chaos. Some of the houses were falling down, some were already destroyed, all of the roads were gone. The sewers were open and the place stank. It was obvious to the researchers that the cause of this massive landslide lay deep down in the mountain. Landowners tried in vain to save the valuable wood before it gets destroyed by the landslide. You can't stop the movement when it's as deep set as it was in Sibratsk fell. Aided by a helicopter full of high-tech equipment, geophysicists from the Geological Survey of Austria set out to find the cause of the deep-seated landslide. It is an ambitious project. The objective is to fly over the Alps, meter by meter, in order to identify danger zones. A probe hanging beneath the helicopter transmits electromagnetic fields. With the help of this high-tech equipment, the scientists can penetrate as far as 100 meters deep into the ground. Water, for example, has low electric resistance. Its trace can be found very easily. The results of the data collected at Sibratskfell show that the landslide began 80 meters down in the ground, where water had turned clay into a gelatinous mass. Because of the results of the data, they've been able to produce a map highlighting the areas of vulnerability and making landslide predictions more accurate. During their research, the scientists also discovered that the landslide in question was just one in a long series of mudslides. A long history with long breaks. According to local residents, the chapel, built in the 17th century, had never been damaged before. When everyone has long forgotten about the 1.4 square kilometers of sliding earth, the mountainside will move again. Of that, there is no doubt. Danger zone maps help residents in landslide-prone areas not to forget where the high-risk zones are actually located. Oregon, in the northwest of the United States. This is probably the only mountain in the world which has experienced more than 100 debris flows. But the people here do not fight against mudslides. They create them artificially. Scientists from the United States Geological Survey build their own sliding mountains to find out what kinds of ground composition speed up or slow down landslides. Geologist Rick Lahusen and the team discuss lengthening the 95-meter mudslide slope for today's test.
today's experiments we're looking at how debris flow picks up material along channels because some debris flows as they come down slope will deposit themselves and just run out of steam and stop others will continue to scour the material along the channel bottom and the channel sides and get larger and larger and larger as they go downstream and of course that has a much larger impact downstream as it hits inhabited areas the bed sediment will be saturated with water for this experiment the mudslide is a mixture of sand, earth and fine gravel. Geologist Richard Iverson feels some kind of tension. It's sort of a, a mixed feeling of anticipation and uh, interest in seeing what's going to happen, how the experiment turns out. And it would also a, a sense of um, hoping that nothing goes badly wrong. The slope is as steep as an average debris flow mountain slope. And so at a speed of more than 50 kilometers an hour, the flow is also as fast as a real one. The 10 cubic meters of debris is the most precisely measured mudslide in the world. This precision is necessary to enable the researchers to collect data, speed, pressure distribution of grains during the flow and afterwards. It all helps the scientists to understand the monsters a little better. Well, a typical run only lasts 10, 20, or 30 seconds, but we're collecting 500 measurements on each second on each of 20 different sensors, so we're getting about 10,000 measurements per second. But first, it has to rain. Richard Iverson expects that liquefaction will occur when the weight of the overriding debris flow is borne largely by the water in the bed sediment. It'll probably be quite sluggish when it first hits the sediment and then some later arriving debris will probably sort of push through and over that sediment and get more of it moving forward and eventually there'll probably be quite a, a large quantity that will discharge from the mouth of the flume. That's my best guess. Pressurization of the water reduces the strength of the bed sediment by reducing friction at grain contacts. As a result, the bed sediment is easily scoured and entrained. Even something this small can be lethal, and then of course if, if you uh, amplify this by uh, several orders of magnitude, hundreds or thousands of times larger, then the destructive potential is pretty obvious. Wow, look at it, it's coming down the hill here. Whoa. Oregon again. It seems Mother Earth here is specialized in sliding. Go! Yeah! Come on, look, come on! Keep getting it, keep getting it! Yes! Come on, come on, right that track break, Lucy. Get in the back of my truck, get in the back of my truck! fast-moving but also slow-moving mudslides are tested at the flume. At a first glance they seem harmless in comparison to their faster relatives, but in some regions of the USA they cause just as much damage. The worst problem here is in the United States, not so much because they produce the largest number of flows, but because there are more people living in the vicinity of these flows, is around California. <laughs> San Francisco, more than 770,000 inhabitants meet with tens of thousands of commuters every day. Many of them are happy returning to their houses in the San Francisco Bay at the end of their working day. Here, the most popular building sites are in the mountains with a nice view. But beauty and danger are closely knit in the Bay Area, and danger sleeps very lightly.
Geologist David Howell knows that landslides have raged here before and could begin again at any time. My question is, do those people even know there's a landslide here? I, I, I can't help think that they must know it, particularly because this, this face just sparkles when the sun is on it, and you can see it throughout San Francisco Bay. You can be at Stanford University and climb up on Hoover Tower, and you can see this. In 1982, the hills of San Francisco began Watch to move. Out. Watch out! Watch out! In a 24-hour uh, period, we had uh, between 15 and 25 inches of rain, depending upon where you were. And we had 18,000 debris flows in one night. 18,000 debris flows. Incredible. And the same thing can happen every time it rains heavily. Still, more and more people continue to build houses here. I remember coming out uh, three or four months after the landslide, and I saw a realtor w with a dressed in a nice suit with a young couple waving his hands describing the kind of house that they could build there. And I, and I, I sort of said, don't, don't build a house there. Uh, but obviously uh, we saw that they've built two brand new houses that are probably two or three million dollars. Very expensive houses that are right at the base of this big landslide. Nobody can predict for sure when a mountain slope will break loose. In the Bay Area, the probability of it happening sometime is very high. What we need to do, though, is be aware of the landslides and do proper engineering circumstances in some places, and in other places we just have to avoid. And, and uh, my own personal opinion, this would have been a place to avoid building. You can really see where the Scientists from the United States Geological Survey search continually for places where it is not safe for people to build houses. Geologist Russell Gramer tried to get the information across to the people. The is much flatter. We went around to every county uh, government and talked to them about the landslide hazard in their county. We presented them with the maps of the landslide hazards that we had prepared. We told them that we expected a, a very wet El Nino winter and uh, tried to do whatever we could to help them get prepared for it. People probably would not ignore the USGS scientists' warnings if they knew what kind of unstable bedrock they are living on in the San Francisco Bay Area. The infamous San Andreas Fault runs through the middle of the San Francisco Bay. Here, tectonic plates rub against each other, and like in a giant stone mill, the Earth's crust is ground into a crumbly material. Geologist Raymond Wilson knows that leads people to a wrong idea. We all grow up with this idea of the solid Earth, the terra firma. And in fact, that's not true at all. And so, even though it's called bedrock and shown as, as older material on a geologic map, it's really very weak. Most of what holds rock and dirt on a hill slope is friction. And when this material gets wet, it has almost no friction. It's almost like Teflon it's, or grease. It's very slippery. In fact, the Indians had a name for it that translates to soapstone because it felt slippery like soap and uh, it has almost no strength and it's very heavy and so gravity pulls on it and so if you can get this stuff wet enough long enough it will come down the hill patricia and stephen slatunich know exactly what raymond wilson means on a rainy evening in february 1997 they went to bed unsuspectingly you could hear the house move it's a big loud snap and you can feel the jolt but what the terrible noises actually meant became visible the following day. We'd come out the next day and the hill would have dropped eight feet overnight. In eight hours it would drop eight feet and it took less than two and a half weeks to slide completely onto the road, uh, which is about 90 feet in elevation lower than where we are here. Stephen Zlatunich took one last photo of his neighbor's house before it disappeared forever. Having witnessed their neighbor's fate, 
Patricia and Stephen became aware that they were living on top of a creeping landslide and didn't know when it would stop moving. They often thought of simply running away. I felt, I don't know if Pat just went along with me or not, but I felt that the day you move out is the day you give up. And I, I always, I've always felt things will turn. I anticipate the worst, but I always expect the best. This creeping landslide had no slippery layer. Everything slid. The soapstone rolled around like dough. A protective wall was built to save the remaining houses and an essential water pipe buried below the road. Up to the foundations of the Zvatunich's house, the loose earth was removed. You're on the verge of despair because everything you have will be gone. We're not at an age where we could start over again uh, that easily. So I don't believe in my life I've ever had such a mixture of feelings. There's nothing I could compare it with. Nothing. Unnerved by 10 months of construction, Patricia and Stephen finally saw the new protective wall growing, a sight for sore eyes. We only have a wall halfway across our house, so there's still half the house that has no wall and you're on natural terrain. I'd live on that sooner than live on this. I feel way more comfortable with that than this. Behind the finished wall, the hillside was refilled. Only time will tell whether or not the work was really effective or was simply a bit of cosmetic surgery on an unstable foundation. And that wall looks very massive and impressive. Um, actually, what it's doing is basically holding the earth in place and protecting the roadway from, from rocks and stuff falling down. It's not really holding the hillside up. What holds the hillside up is the friction within the, the soil and the rock itself. And it's, if that gets wet enough again, and it probably will, it may only move a few centimeters. If so, then you can simply repair the wall and, 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 and go, go some more. If it moves a couple of meters or tens of meters as it did in 1997, then they'll have to try something else. At the test slope in Oregon, the researchers examined the behavior of debris while crashing against hindrances. There is a real chance, in my opinion, of, of helping people in a number of ways. One, of course, is, is hoping that we can directly save some lives by keeping people out of harm way. But also in the longer term, I, I think that maybe even a more important role is that as we learn more about these hazardous kinds of events, we can do a better job of planning for them and planning to avoid them. While developing the theoretical models, Iverson often thinks of people who narrowly escaped disaster. People whose path was directly in line with the debris flow, who managed to escape uh, just as the flow was hitting the back of their house and escaped with only a few of their possessions. They lost almost all of their property. And then after the flow had occurred, they decided they wanted to recover a little bit of their property and actually waded out into the debris and almost got into very serious trouble not being able to get out of the liquefied debris as they tried to extract some of their property from their house. Mountain slopes can be protected from landslides if forests remain untouched. Mass deforestation destroys this natural protection. When leaves and needles no longer cover the ground, water seeps into the earth, and the danger of landslides increases. When trees were chopped down in the mountains around Sarno in Italy, and unregulated building took place, the disaster was just a matter of time. Two days of continuous rain had softened the earth right down to the limestone layer. On the 5th of May 1998, several huge debris flows raged through Sarno, home to 31,000 people. Like a multi-limbed monster, the landslide tore through the narrow streets and yards, crushing surprised people in their homes. The lives of 137 people were a high price to pay for disturbing the fragile ecosystem.
The Condo Glen in Switzerland is considered the gateway to the south. Two forces of nature have been threatening the small village Gondo as long as anyone could remember. The mountain stream, Daveria, and bare rock walls of the Chugan mountain. Farmers who understand the forces of nature in mountainous areas have never settled there. One of them is Joseph Squalati. He lives in the neighboring valley and believes what was always said about Gondo. If anything comes down here, it's going to be the entire mountain. Rockfall is a common occurrence in mountainous areas. In 2003, more than 50 people fell victim to rockfall in Switzerland alone. The people of Gondo have always known about the danger of the Chugan mountain. In the 1980s, the local government decided to protect the village by building an eight meter high rockfall protection wall. Doris Jordan Squarati, living at the foot of the Chugan mountain, welcomed the investment. We trusted the wall. It gave us a sense of security when it came to rockfall. The energy of rockfall can be compared to the energy of dynamite. The mass of rock in this test weighs six tons. Thrown from a height of 50 meters, it has about the same energy as a third of a kilo of dynamite. An early warning system could be the better investment to save lives. Scientists from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology observe rock falls as they develop. Their objective is to create such a system. In 1991, about 30 million cubic meters of rock tumbled down the mountain, coming to a halt just before the small Swiss village of Randa. The scientists set up their laboratory at an altitude of almost 2,500 meters. Sensors have been placed in three drill holes, 50 to 120 meters deep. There are no sliding sheets in this rock by nature, but they could form at any time. The question is simply where and when. Geologist Simon Löw from Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and his team try to find out what leads to rockfall when there is no layer separating the sliding mass from the subsoil. These trennflächen in this hang here the separating layers in this slope probably don't yet run through the whole mountain to form sliding layers tilted at the right angle. There are probably a few separating layers which are in the right place, maybe 300 meters under the ground we're standing on. But maybe they're not connected to each other. Now that means these separating layers have to connect along newly formed clefts and fractured structures in order to form a further structure, perhaps similar to the ones we have here. The probes deep down in the drill holes constantly transmit data about malformations of the drill holes. Watching water pressure and tiny tremors inside the rock is also important for detecting and analyzing rock slide processes that involve the progressive development of a failure surface. Suspicious mountains like the Chugan in Gondo could become more predictable. However, in Gondo, the danger came from a direction nobody was expecting. In October 2000, it began to rain like it had never rained before. I've never seen so much rain. Everything was flooded. The streets were destroyed. The streams swollen. It was a frightening sight. And built the scrovens. The narrow Daveria swelled into a raging river. The villagers of Gondo watched the river below the village day and night. The banks had already been destroyed. On the 14th of October, Roland Squalati left his office. The local president of Gondo had spent all night discussing the situation with his brothers. 
We parted here. My brothers headed for the fire department in the lower part of the village, and I was on my way to the civilian shelter. Deafening noise made him stop. I turned around and saw trees being torn down and disappearing behind the tower. And there was no sign of his brothers where he had left them. I took the phone and called my brother. When his mailbox came on, I knew immediately that he was dead. Then he got through to a radio station and thousands of people heard his cry for help. It's a disaster. You just can't imagine it. We're sitting on a landslide right in the middle of the village. Half the village is gone. All at once, everything was swept away. Ten houses with people in them are just gone. We don't know how many people yet. We have to get out of here. The people have to get away. But the streets had been destroyed by other landslides and the fog was thickening. I was thinking, no one's coming. We're on our own today. There seemed no way for help to get through. Then the sky opened and Swiss helicopter pilots risked their lives to save the trapped people. Without heavy equipment, the rescuers began digging with their bare hands. Andrei Cherik watched them. Then my sister came and told me my son Martin was dead. No, he went home, I said. Then she told me that our house was gone. What? Our house isn't just gone, I said. Then I went up and I couldn't believe it. The four-story building with four apartments was simply swept away. The heavy rainfall caused a landslide to break loose above the protective wall. 200 tons of debris per meter pressed against the wall. After a few minutes, it broke away explosively. Not rockfall, as the people of Gondo had always feared, but a gigantic landslide decided their fate. Three 500-ton blocks of cement from the wall were swept down into the village. From Five members of one family were killed. The mother was killed with her daughter and her husband, and a son and his wife too. The son Roger was with me at the fire department. We'd been working together all night from Friday to Saturday before the disaster. Despite exhaustion, Roland Squarati declined a cup of coffee and went to his office. He went to his mother's place and had a cup of coffee with his sister and brother-in-law and his wife. And that's when they died. It was the first cement block that hit the Stockhalper Tower that also hit the building. The victims were still sitting in their chairs when the search team found them. Even for the experts, the search for missing people was extremely dangerous. Everything was still moving. Roland Squalati had to drag a woman away from the rubble where she was trying to search on her own. She said to me, look down there, it's Herman. He was a brother of mine. And I said, come away from here. And she said to me, no, look, he's down there. And then we saw him lying face down in the mud, about five meters from the stream. But it was impossible to get through the landslide to Herman. As night fell, Roland Squarati saw his brother for the last time. The rescue teams concentrated on a building from which they heard knocking sounds coming. They dug through the night until they reached the cellar. But there was nobody to be found in the building. By morning, they realized that the knocking had been a mistake. And all they found was dead bodies. All of the bodies we recovered must have died on impact. They were all so broken that there is no way they could have survived for the three or four days it took to get to them. 
Gabriel and Hermann Squarati were both in the prime of their lives when they died. They were both fathers and sons. For a long time, Genoveva Squarati could not give up hope. It was really tough on me, losing two of them at the same time. We presume they must have fallen into the Doveria and swept away towards Italy. Two or three months after the disaster, we began a search party with 1,300 people from the Oberwallis Fire Department because they were both firemen. We searched from Gondo to Lago Maggiore. That's about 60 kilometers. But the search was in vain. Now I'd rather we don't find them. They're probably somewhere in the debris, maybe not even fully intact. What with the mudslide, the rocks, the buildings, the wood, the furniture and all, everything was just pulverized. A memorial stone was erected in memory of the brothers. They're not buried in the ceremony. They found their place of rest elsewhere. Once part of a mountain breaks off, nothing can stop the destructive force of the falling rock. But clever technology could provide protection. Flexible wire nets or rigid protective walls. No question for Swiss engineer Marcel Senhauser. All of the rigid constructions, such as wood and steel fixtures, are going to be destroyed because they are much too stiff. Picture the walls of a building. The impacting rock rips through the whole building and simply comes out of the other side. Marcel Senhauser catches the rocks like fish. The idea is to give the impact time to slow down and distribute its energy throughout the system so the impact isn't concentrated in one area. Putting too much pressure on the net, causing it or the ropes to rip, that's the basic concept. A unique test will prove the durability of the nets. The open quarry of Wallenstadt in Switzerland provides the perfect conditions for a new world record. The record-breaking net is fixed onto special hooks, which can hold weights of up to five tons. Such nets were used during World War II to protect vulnerable coastal areas from submarine attacks. Even the strongest nets have never managed to withstand that much weight. It's suspenseful every time, especially with the big ones. And once you hear the sound, it's, how should I describe it? Yeah, it's an indescribable sound. It always goes right through to your heart. If rocks weighing more than a certain weight fall, so-called brake rings contract to form a knot. The metal ropes extend and the net becomes elastic. In Gondo today, these elastic nets are a safety measurement, in addition to a new protective wall. Even if there is no danger of another landslide, Gondo still continues to live with the fear of rock fall from the Chugan mountain and with the memory of the great disaster. It wasn't a village anymore. It was a heap of rubble. Now at least a little life has returned to the village. Two buildings have been built and completed, but it's not the same. The once thriving village lost 13 people, about 8% of its population, to the landslide. The half of the population is weggezogen. Half of the people moved away, about a hundred of them. Gondo is still alive, but it's going to be tough in the future. Many of the young couples have left the village forever, but not all of them. 
Es war schon ein Thema für uns, wegzugehen. We did think about moving away because at the beginning we weren't sure about what was going to happen. We thought about moving to Brig on the other side of the mountain. Doris Jordan's parents' house was spared by the landslide. She believes that's a good omen. We're both from here, we were born here and grew up here. That's why we're still here and why we're going to stay. Developments in science and technology may succeed in making some dangerous areas safer. However, one should not ignore the fact that the best protection against landslides and rockfall is to take researchers' warning seriously and not move to places which by nature belong to debris flow and falling rocks. The Earth is a dynamic planet and it is best to keep our distance when it is at its most active.